overthink in England. It's really interesting to be back in Estevan. Uh, and I have to say, I'm going to project. I think I've got a mic that I hope is live, but I'm just going to project. I used to tell my students that growing up in Saskatchewan, I learned how to call cattle from three miles away. It's a lie, but I'm going to project anyway. I left Estevan permanently in 1969, a long time ago. And I haven't been back in 25 years. And it was fun to drive down, do I call it Main Street or Fourth Street? I mean, it's the same, right? And see what has changed and what has not. Some things are the same, some things are different, but it really was fun. And what I wanted to do, and I thank Gord for inviting me, um, he asked me to come and talk about a set of things. He asked me to explain how a kid from Estevan ends up at MIT. I'll make that short, but I will tell you how I got there, and hopefully some of that, especially for younger people listening in, maybe some of this will resonate with you. I'll tell you how MIT encourages innovation, because some of those lessons, I hope, will carry over to you thinking about how you can do something. And then I'll show you an example of something my students and I built, Image Guided Surgical Systems, uh, and give you a sense of that. I will warn you when the really gross pictures come up, so you can look away if you're squeamish, but I want to tell you about that. And I'll end with just a little bit of advice. But I want to start by telling you my connection to this City. I know by Saskatchewan definition, it is a city. Um, I was born in St. Joseph's, the original one, which I understand is no longer there, but that's the picture of the original one. I went to Westview, which I understand is still there. I hope it's been renovated, because otherwise it's got to be really old, but I went to Westview. Um, I do remember as a kid sneaking over to Clem's Grocery, which I'm sure is probably not there, but some of you may remember it. Clem Fertowski, and buying candy for 10 cents, which was amazing. But I do remember going to Westview. And I went to ECI through grade 10, which I understand is no longer there, but there's a wonderful memorial to it. Um, people here of different ages, if you're young enough, your parents or your grandparents, or maybe you're some of them, may have had my father as a teacher. He was a French teacher at ECI, and he was the vice principal. And I know some of you, I know some of you here actually taught with him, so thank you. And some of you may have taken piano lessons from my mother. She taught piano out of our house for many years. So I grew up here. How in the world did I end up at MIT? Well, in 69, my family and I moved to Regina, and I completed my high school there at Campbell Collegiate. Um, I am, by the way, the second most famous person from my cast at, Clamble, at Campbell. Because Connie Calder, the, the singer, was in my class, and she's much more famous than I. We have competitions who has bigger following. She wins. <clears throat> and I went to U of R. And part of the story I want to tell you here is I made an easy choice. U of R was right there. I could live at home while I went there. It was the easy choice to go to. And I've regretted a little bit, but I just went to U of R, and I majored in math and physics. I think I'm the first student to double major because I used to have to go in and argue with the dean to let me have permission to do both courses. But I majored in math and physics. One of the opportunities I had while I was there, which is important to thinking about stretching your experience, through one of the professors there, I had an opportunity in two summers to do an internship in a lab in Italy, a little place called Arco Felice, just outside of Naples. And uh, it was in cybernetics. Think of that as a precursor to AI. But it was a chance to get a sense of what's research about and to get a sense of a different culture. And they're both really valuable things. When I graduated from U of R, I knew I wanted to go to grad school. I wasn't really certain whether I wanted to be an academic or I was going to work in industry, but I wanted to go to grad school. And I had three choices. I could go to Waterloo and study math, great place. I could go to UBC and study physics, another great place. Or I could go to MIT and study artificial intelligence and math. Now, it's an interesting choice. And one of the lessons I want to communicate to you was, as you can probably already figure out, I chose MIT, but it was based on a great piece of advice from a mentor, a young faculty member in math at MIT, sorry, at, at, at U of R, who basically said, look, you're a really good mathematician. You could go be a math professor somewhere in Canada, but you're not stretching. 
you're not reaching, you're not taking a gamble. And his advice was, don't take the safe path out. Stretch yourself. The worst that happens is you just come back to Regina. I don't know if that's necessarily a great thing, but the worst thing that happens is you come back. But stretch yourself. A great piece of advice, and I chose to go to MIT. So what was it like when I showed up in Boston? Well, I'm gained for some of you, especially younger people either here or listening in, it's going to be a little daunting, so I want to give you a sense. Uh, first of all, I suffered from serious imposter syndrome. So I'm going to move this out of the way. I spent the first six months doing this. It's not a neurological disorder. I was waiting for somebody to tap me on the shoulder and say, we're really sorry. We just discovered that we thought we put your application in this pile. We accidentally put it in the admitted pile. I couldn't figure out why in the world I was at MIT. Serious imposter syndrome. I'll come back to that. I got to experience big city shock. Right? I've been living in Regina. It's a big city. And then I got to Boston. And uh, just to give you a sense of that, this is a picture of Boston. The, the tower you can see there is the uh, Prudential Tower. Right next to it is the Hancock Tower. It used to be you could go up to the top floor of the Hancock Tower. It's, I don't know, 50 stories high. There's an observation deck there, and you could look out. And when you looked out, I realized you could see more people than there are in the entire province of Saskatchewan. That was a frightening thought. Three and a half million people. I got to experience Boston drivers. Boston has been described as the only city in North America where you have to back in to double park. Think about that for a second. And one of the rules you learn in Boston is um, do not make eye contact with another driver because that seeds every right to the road. So you just put the blinders on and just barrel ahead. Interesting. And I got to experience weird accents. If you talk to somebody who's a native Bostonian, they park their car in Harvard Yard. They don't pronounce the R's. Actually, they do. They put them at the end of other words. They say the island of Cuba, not Cuba. But they park their car in Harvard Yard. Weird accent. And to my surprise, I had people tell me I had an accent. And I would realize that if I was talking to somebody at some point, they'd say, are you Canadian? And I would realize that somewhere along the way, I had said out and about. I cannot hear the difference. You probably can't either, but if you say that word, they'll know you're Canadian. Go figure. But the real issue was imposter syndrome. What in the world is a kid from Estevan, Saskatchewan, doing at MIT? And I want to give you a little bit of a sense of that because I hope some of you will think about what you can do to move forward. One of the things I discovered about MIT, it's not just true of MIT, it's true of many other great places, including a lot of great tech industry. It's a meritocracy. What that means is it's the merit of your ideas that matters, not your background. Just give you a quick sense. MIT is what we refer to as a pure need-blind admissions, need-based aid institution. When we admit a student, we look only at how good a match are they for the place. We don't look at are they able to afford it. We know the tuition's really high. And once we've admitted them, then we make the decision about how much financial aid will be provided to them. Something that's not well known in Canada, I want to give you a sense that this is true at MIT, it's true of a lot of other great American institutions, but let me give you the MIT number. If a student's admitted to MIT today, they come from a family that earns less than $140,000 a year U.S., they pay no tuition, zero. They'll pay a little bit of the, the living cost. We want you to have some skin in the game. That represents 30% of our students. They're just really smart kids that we want to be there and we want them to succeed. They pay no tuition. Sticker prices, I think 65000 they pay no tuition. The other thing I discovered is that graduate students, I was one of them. Yes, many of them come from Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Stanford, the great American institutions. But they come from U of R or Montana State or, uh, I don't know, uh, Missouri at, 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 at wherever. I mean, there are students from other places. And they get involved. And in particular... What I realized was, at a place like that, and it's true everywhere else, or not everywhere else, many other places, if you have an idea, you can defend it, you can explain it, and you can adapt it to constructive criticism, people will take you seriously. I used to run a big research lab, and it would be very common that I'd have a, a, a weekly group meeting, it would be myself, a couple of junior professors, three or four postdocs, a dozen graduate students, four or five undergraduates. 
And somewhere in that conversation, an undergraduate, a second year student would say, why don't we do it this way? And we'd stop, we'd discuss, and there's a good chance we'd say, you know what? We're gonna try it that way, because it's a different way of thinking about it. So don't be afraid to defend your ideas, because you'll have an impact. So once I got to MIT, I hate to admit this, 48 years ago, I never left. And just to give you a quick sense of trajectory, I joined the faculty in 1984, professor of computer science. For 20 years, and you'll see why, I was also, uh, by courtesy, a lecturer at Harvard Medical School, a great medical school in Boston. I have the honor of holding the Bernard M. Gordon Chair of Medical Engineering. It's a fancy title, but it basically says I get a little extra scholarly allowance every year to spend on things. And in the uh, mid-2000s, I started moving into administration. So I had, uh, sorry, I led MIT's largest department for six years, and then spent two years as chancellor. And I always have to explain, chancellor means different things in different places. Here in Saskatchewan, chancellor at U of R, chancellor at U of S is an honorary position. At MIT, the chancellor is the senior officer that oversees everything related to students admissions, financial aid, student life, athletics, curricular issues. So you see everything dealing with students. I used to complain to the president that there are um, two chancellors in, in, in Cambridge. I was chancellor at, in, at MIT in Cambridge and the University of Cambridge has a chancellor. And at that time, the Cambridge chancellor was the Duke of Edinburgh. And I used to complain that, you know, his housing allowance was a whole lot bigger than mine, but it got nowhere. And then for the last 10 years, I've been Chancellor for Academic Advancement. Simply said, I act as MIT's ambassador. I meet with alumni and alumnae. I meet with parents. I meet with individuals that share some of MIT's passion for making the world a better place and just build partnerships. And this will be relevant at the very end. At the uh, end of June last year, I got asked to add another position as Vice President for Open Learning. So I oversee all of our efforts around using digital learning to help educate students. And I'm gonna come back to that at the end. I could do a poll about who's heard of MIT. I suspect most of you know, but just in case you don't have a sense of the place, I just wanna give you a very quick sense of MIT and why this is such a change. There are lots of rankings of, of universities. I think in Canada, McLean's, I don't know, does McLean still do the ranking? Okay. In the US, the big ones, US News and World Report, MIT has been the number one engineering school every year since the ranking started in 1983. I do not want to be the Dean of Engineering the year we fall to number two because <laughs> you'll be shot. But we're ranked number two in the United States overall last year behind Princeton. Forbes has a ranking and we're ranked number one in the US. I like the Forbes ranking because there's another great university in Cambridge, Massachusetts, Harvard, we're good rivals. In Forbes ranking, Harvard's 15th and we're one, so we kind of like that. QS is an international ranking. You get the idea. We're ranked number one in the world. And then Times Higher Education is a British ranking system. It's a little, they all use different measures. I think THC has got a little bias because Oxford and Cambridge throw up in the top five, which is perfectly reasonable. And MIT's fifth, third among American universities. I'll give you one last piece of MIT because we are basically a science and engineering place. Since 1945, which was the year that the first MIT person won a Nobel Prize, MIT has won more Nobel Prizes than any other university anywhere. And overall, uh, we've won 97 Nobel Prizes, fourth among all universities. And when you say winning a Nobel Prize, it's either a faculty member or an alumnus that has won. So we are science and engineering school. So, I don't know if it gives you a sense of how I ended up there. I'm still waiting for that tap on the shoulder. But it's been fun to come from a place like Estevan and be able to follow a path that lets you end up being one of the five senior officers of MIT that runs an institution of that kind of caliber. I wanted to talk about innovation. And so I want to give you a little bit of a sense of how MIT supports innovation, because I think a lot of what Gord and his team are trying to do here with the help of the college has some similar roots. I'm gonna start with some examples of MIT spinoffs. You may recognize some of these. These are all ones that I happen to pick out because I know the founders, it's kind of fun. The top image, that's the Roomba, iRobot, founded by Rod Brooks, Colin Angle, and Helen Greiner, two students that I taught and a fellow faculty member. The second one, if you've never seen this, that's Atlas. This is a humanoid robot built by Boston Dynamics, started by Mark Rayburg. 
If you've never seen the video, Lord, you've got to send it around. There is a video on YouTube of Atlas dancing, which is truly phenomenal. You have to go watch it, but it's another great uh, company. The third image is um, a company founded by a student on whose thesis committee I served. It's called Mobileye. It does the vision systems for autonomous and assisted driving incredibly well. Um, the founder, Amnon Shashua, is worth about one and a half billion dollars today. And the company's worth about $15 billion. And then the bottom one you may have heard of, that's Moderna. Two of the four uh, phone counties, yeah, two of the four co-founders of Moderna are MIT people, um, including Bob Langer, who is the most cited engineer in history. But they're examples of things that come out of MIT. We take innovation seriously. And just to give you a sense of that, we did a study, 2017. We tried to estimate how many companies are there anywhere in the world with the property that one of the founders is an MIT graduate and they're still active in the company. So uh, HP would not count, even though it's an MIT uh, spinoff. Gillette, you didn't know it, the Razor Company, MIT creation. So is Campbell Soup Company. Um, Bose would not count because the founders have passed away. What we found is there are 30,000 companies around the world with an MIT founder. We only have 140,000 living alumni. We've generated about four and a half million jobs. And the number I love is if you put their gross annual revenues together, our estimate is 1.9 trillion US dollars. The governor of Massachusetts is very annoyed because if MIT was a sovereign nation, and we had all those companies as part of MIT, or if we could bring them all back to Massachusetts, we would have been the ninth largest economy in the world, right behind Russia, right ahead of India. Interesting place to be. Innovation is part of what we do. And I want to tell you three quick stories about students' paths, because I want to give you a sense, and I know there are some young people there. This could be you, right? Maybe you'll see yourself in this, or maybe you'll see your children in this. I want to tell you three stories about how MIT students succeed. First one's a gentleman named Tuan Pham. You might guess from his name, his nationality. He's Vietnamese. Tuan, his mother, and his brother got out of Saigon at the end of the Vietnamese War, the fall of Saigon. They were what we used to call boat people. They were literally on a boat, turned away by Singapore, turned away by Malaysia. After a long journey, they eventually ended up in rural Maryland. His father was left behind in Vietnam for 15 years before he got out. Tuan's mother had been an accountant in Saigon. In the U.S., she couldn't get authorized to deal with it, so she worked as a cashier in a gas station during the day and bagged groceries at night in a grocery store. And Tuan went to a very, to be blunt, weak high school in rural Maryland. A smart kid. Applied to MIT, got admitted discovered that we were gonna pay his entire way through MIT, got there and discovered a passion for making computer systems that can run incredibly quickly. And Tuan just retired as the CTO of Uber. I'll tell you a second story. This is one of my students, Xiaowo Tang. Xiaowo grew up in Northern China, in a rural part of China. It's hard to believe there's any rural parts of China, but there are a few in Northern China. By the way, weather very similar to here. Uh, you can imagine what that's like. You know what that's like, because you live here. Um, went to an unknown Chinese university and then came to MIT as a graduate student and studied computer science. And had a passion for computer vision, for making cameras see. Went back to China, actually wanted to stay in the US, unfortunately couldn't went back to China and started a company that today is the largest AI company in the world. It's called SenseTime. It does face recognition remarkably well. And Tuan personally is worth about $6 billion because he built a company that is incredibly successful. And the third story is Drew Houston and Arash Ferdowsi. Undergraduates at MIT, Drew was always frustrated that he forgot his notes for class behind. And as a consequence, he teamed up with Arash, who had a passion for building systems that could handle huge amounts of data. And they're the founders of Dropbox, which you probably, or many of you, I'm sure, sure use. 
Drew, by the way, grew up in the Boston area. He came from, a, I won't say an affluent family, but a, a, a well-educated family. Hirash is second generation American. His parents grew up in Iran and he grew up in Kansas City and went to a really weak high school and again found a passion at MIT. You can succeed if you're willing to work at it. And so what are the paths to success that MIT provides? And this, I hope Gord fits with things that you're trying to do. One of the things we do is we provide, what we jokingly call sandboxes. Places to play and there are free toys. You can think of them like maker spaces, but they can also be just places to get access to software, to get access to the cloud. But it's a place to both go and build something, but especially to get training by other students who've already done it. MIT, in typical fashion, we have um, 300,000 square feet of maker space spread out through campus. Unfortunately, it's in 83 different locations. So you have to go find it, but you have a place to go build things. Second thing we do, which I know is very much what you're trying to do here, is convening spaces. MIT has an innovation center, five stories high. It's open 24 seven because students say they have their best ideas at three o'clock in the morning. I think it's just they're sleep deprived and they think they have their best ideas at three o'clock in the morning, but nonetheless, it's where they wanna be there. And they can go and work. And as you can see from the picture, it's open spaces so that you're not just stuck in a cubicle somewhere, you're talking to somebody. You're working on something and you keep getting distracted and you finally say to the person next to you, what the hell are you working on? It looks really interesting. And you build networks, you build connections, you build teams, and that helps you build your idea. And the third thing we provide are mentoring services. Most of famous one in MIT is called Venture Mentoring Services. They've actually now done training for I think 100 other universities. These are retired MIT alumni, usually former executives, who provide free advice to students on everything from how do you write a business plan? How do you file for a patent? How do you deal with marketing? Or my favorite, HR issues. As one student said, getting advice on how do you fire your best friend? Because that startup isn't going the direction you wanted it to. Not an easy thing to do. One of the things MIT does is we have a law clinic. We don't have a law school. We have a law clinic on campus. And a student could go in and get free advice from the law clinic. It's staffed by law students at Boston University. And you get free advice on anything. One of the fun parts about it is after we started the law clinic with BU, admission, sorry, applicants to BU law doubled because the BU students wanted to hang out with the MIT students to see where that next great idea is gonna come from. But these are important pieces. A place to play, to build something, a place to build networks, to get people to connect with you, and a chance to get great advice. And those are the pieces I will pull together. I'm gonna to bring it together at the end. But again, if you're a young person, I know there are some here. By the way, at my age, everybody's a young person except for my former teachers, because they're a little older than me. But even if you're at a different stage and you're thinking about doing something different, be willing to explore an idea and have it fail, and then try it again, and try it again until it succeeds. Find ways to build connections to people who've done it before because they can give you great advice and be willing to ask and listen to critical questions. I'll give you a quick example. I must admit I hate name dropping, but my job is Chancellor for Academic Advancement. I get to see interesting people around the world. Um, I had a chance to interact with um, the founder of Facebook, whose name I'm forgetting, Mark Zuckerberg. Whew. I was, a, I was a Harvard guy, so I don't really care. But talking to Mark, and I, I was asking him, I said, so Facebook, first thing you tried? And he laughed and said, no, fifth. The other four you've never heard of because they didn't work. But I learned enough about why they didn't work to make the fifth one work. And that's why Facebook turned out the way it did. And I realized I missed a slide back here. And I, I just got to go back to show you one of the perks. Did I miss it? Ah, yes. You may have spotted that middle image. One of the perks about being a senior officer at MIT, you get to welcome the commencement speaker. And so I got to hang out with that gentleman, Matt Damon, for uh, about an hour. And that was sort of fun because you get the chance to see why he thinks about innovation in a different way. But let me stop name dropping. Let's go on to what I want to talk about, which is, again, I want to show you an example 
of something that my group and I innovated to give you a sense of the way in which you can have impact around the world, and then I'll bring it back together. So for 20 years, I collaborated with a group and one of the great Boston hospitals, Brigham and Women's Hospital, I had a position at Harvard Med, and we were interested in building image-guided surgical systems. And I'm gonna warn you in a second, this is gonna get a little gory, like right now. See, now you're all looking at the screen. Imagine you're a patient with a brain tumor, right up here. It's very close to motor cortex, the part of your brain that controls movement. You'd like to get the tumor out, but not paralyze the patient. And I'm gonna rerun this. Traditionally, surgeon's gonna see an MR scan. You're gonna see a tumor, uh, it went by a little quickly. And traditionally, what a surgeon has to do is to look at that scan and then look at the patient and try and figure out, where do I cut? So it's seeing surfaces. And so again, very quick, I know there's some people there, I'm sure with medical experience, what happens is you do what's called a skin flap, you open up a piece of the skin, you do what's called a craniotomy, you pull out a piece of skull, which you'll put back in later, and you expose the cortical surface, and then you go hunting for the tumor. I don't know about you, but I'm not thrilled, no matter how good the neurosurgeon is, with somebody rooting around in my brain with a spoon looking for the tumor. This is not find where's Waldo, I wanna find the tumor with minimum damage to things nearby. And so we were thinking of this as a challenge. How could we change it? And we basically said, somewhat jokingly, we'd like to make neurosurgeons into Superman or Superwoman. What if we could give them x-ray vision, that they could look at a patient and see through skin and bone to see where the structures are? I will tell you, I parenthetically, I hope I'm not going to insult anybody. My experience with most neurosurgeons is they don't think they need any help in becoming Superman or Superwoman. But we're going to do that anyway. We're going to give them a little bit of help. And it's not just show them where things are, but during the surgery, be able to show a surgeon exactly where the tip of their instrument is, both relative to the tumor and relative to structures nearby, so that they can operate through a very small opening and get the tumor out. That was our goal. We wanted to let a surgeon see through skin and bone, see where they're going, and then guide them very accurately to getting the tumor out. So we start with an MR scan. This is a typical MR scan, and I'm gonna show you in a second. If you watch really closely, you're gonna see right there, that's a tumor. And you wanna get it out. And what we wanna do, and I'm not gonna give you all the details, I'm gonna show you examples. We wanna build a very detailed reconstruction of the patient's anatomy. We're going to take that MR scan and we're going to identify. So that green thing, that tennis ball size thing, it's not a tennis ball, it's a tumor. That's what's called the corpus callosum, but we're going to show the surgeon where are the major blood vessels nearby. We're going to show them where the white matter tracks are. I'll explain that in a second. And we're going to show them areas they want to avoid because that's cortical, uh, sorry, that's motor cortex. And so what we need to do is build a model of the patient. Don't worry, you're not, is, I'm not gonna show you all the math and there will be no quiz at the end, unless Gord wants to give you one. But we're gonna use tools that you've heard about to do this. So very quick explanation of MR, multiple, sorry, magnetic resonance imaging. It's basically a big, mag mag yeah, I'm having a hard time today, a big magnetic field where you align up the axes of the water molecules and then relax them. And as they relax, they emit energy. And the amount of water that you have in different parts of tissue is going to cause things to look different brightnesses. So the first thing we do is we identify or learn what different brightnesses in that three-dimensional image correspond to what kinds of tissue. They're called voxels. I mean, you've heard of pixels. That's in a single image. When you've got a volume, they're called a voxel. Now, one of the problems is that different parts of tissue may look the same. The part of corpus callosum, the part of your brain that connects the two parts of the hemisphere, it looks very much like things you'll find down here in the throat, but you know that it's not gonna be down here. So we use AI to learn an atlas of the brain, where are tissue structures normally in the brain? And we learn, use AI to learn typical shapes of structures. Different parts of the brain have a standard shape or a small range of shapes. We put it all together into a big probabilistic system, AI system, and we use it to build models. And these are examples from real neurosurgical cases, um, the green elements in each one are the tumor. And you can see the surgeon can now at least plan. Where is the tumor? How close is it to blood vessels? What things do I want to avoid as I go and get there? 
And while we focused on neurosurgery, we can do the same thing in other parts. Tumor in the, in the throat, um, knee reconstruction, tumor in, in the spine. And the one in the upper right is finding uh, lymph nodes in lungs. Uh, so we can do the same thing to just build models of the patient. To give you a sense of how detailed these can be, that's a CT scan of this portion of, of the body. And from that, we build a computer algorithm that builds a very detailed reconstruction of that patient's blood vessels, from which we can then label the blood vessels and identify how wide they are so you can see anomalies in the blood vessels. So we're building very detailed models of a patient. This can be used in a lot of ways. Um, you can use it for surgical guidance. I'm going to show you that. You can use it to just do simulation. But you can use it for surgical training. This is one of my favorites. This was done by one of my students. When I turned 50, which I have to admit is many years ago, my surgeon said, congratulations, you get to have a colonoscopy. I said, gee, thanks a lot. That sounds like such a fun thing, but you're at that age. And it made me wonder if we could automate that. And so one of my students built a system that takes a scan of a subject and very carefully segments out the intestine so that you can now fly through it. So I'm just going to show you an example of this. This is now a simulation of what a colonoscopy work. That blue spot there, it's a polyp that you probably want to look at. So we've color-coded the things that you probably want to have you know, the surgeon uh, look at as you go through there. I also like this because I told my students, look, if this surgical guidance stuff doesn't work out, there's obviously a video game there. Doesn't this just ski, uh, scream, gut runner, you know, some, Montezuma's revenge, right? I mean, there's got to be something we can do with it. But you see how we can help a surgeon plan ahead. Here's what I want to look at when I'm actually doing the colonoscopy. Or do I even need to do the colonoscopy? I don't see any polyps there of a particular size. Now, building models of the brain, valuable for neurosurgery. MR gives us structural information, the shapes of things. But there's some other information we would like. And I want to show you three examples. We can do what's called functional MR, where we see the particular things that the parts of the brain do. We can use something called DTMR, it's called diffusion tensor MR, I'll explain that in a second, and I'm going to show you um, TMS. If the surgeon is going to take out a tumor, they certainly need to know how to get there. But one of the things you want to avoid is cutting, if you like, the wires in the brain. These are called white matter fibers. They're the things that connect up the different parts of your brain. And using diffusion tensor MR, what it does is it basically lets you build an algorithm that builds the wiring diagram of your brain. And that image you see on the left is literally a reconstruction of my white matter. That's my wiring diagram, if you like. By the way, one of the things that's really valuable, once you do that, you can cluster it into what are called bundles. That turns out to be incredibly valuable in studying multiple sclerosis. Because MS is a disease that crimps those white matter tracts. And being able to see where that's happening gives clinicians an ability to track the disease. But the fun one was, so, so white, matters were going to be, white matter fibers are going to be important. The other one is, as I said, started out with a tumor up here, close to motor cortex. You'd like to know where motor cortex is. Two problems if you're doing the surgery. First of all, it looks like any other kind of cortex. You know where it should be, but the tumor may well have displaced it. And so you'd really like to say, can I map out where motor cortex is? Because I don't want the surgeon to cut there. So we use a technique called Transcranial magnetic simulation. You see this thing on the, on the right? That's a pair of electromagnets in a figure eight shape. If you fire a pulse of electricity through them, it will generate a magnetic field with a very focused hotspot. And the more energy you put in, the lower you'll put that hotspot. If you put it up next to a patient's head and fire a small pulse of energy, it will stimulate about a square millimeter of, 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 of brain. And if you hit a little part of motor cortex, it will cause a muscle to fire. So what we do is we put some trackers on the instrument. You can see it next to my former student, Mike Leventon. We put some tracking points on the subject. And we very carefully line up that model of that subject's brain to the position of the patient. So we know exactly what we're stimulating when we do it. And that lets us map out motor cortex. So this is an example of finding uh, the index finger, the forearm, the biceps, the jaw of a patient. We can paint on the model places to avoid. I was a subject for this a long time ago. You can tell it was a long time ago from that picture. 
That's my motor cortex and that's my visual cortex. It was an interesting experiment. My students thought I was nuts. They're probably right. Because one of them said, look, if your laptop breaks, you don't take your car battery and a couple of jumper cables and zap the thing to see what's wrong. Why would you zap your brain? I said, I don't know. It seemed like a good thing to do. I, I can't resist. I'm going to take two extra minutes, Gord, because I, I can't resist a story. It was an interesting experience. So again, I had cracking on me. And we put um, electrical pickups on, on muscles, mostly on the arm because it's closer to the surface. And the idea was you fire that pulse of energy and then if 17 seconds, sorry, 17 milliseconds later, one of the muscles fires, you can pick it up on an electric pickup and you can map out where you are. I was doing this with a, a neuroradiologist named Vern de Gugino and he would sort of, we, it's an experiment, we would count it, he'd say three, two, one, a zap, which is kind of how it felt like, a little bit like static electricity from you know pulling a sweater off. But at one point he said, I'm gonna do a stimulation and he zapped and he said, oh, um, your finger moved. And I said, no, it didn't. He said, no, 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 I can see it on the pickup. Your finger moved. I said, well, do it again. So I watched my hand. He put the probe back in exactly the same position. He did the stimulation, and it felt, apparently, like my finger moved, but it didn't. Now you think, okay, he just broke something. It took us a little while to figure it out, and then we realized there's something called the central sulcus. It's a portion between two parts of the brain. Motor cortex is on one side, Motor sensory cortex is on the other side. And so the part of your brain that gets the feedback that something has moved is right nearby. And what we realized is we had the angle slightly off and we were directly stimulating motor sensory cortex. So it felt like my finger moved and it didn't. I said, Vern, we got to patent this. This is the world's best exercise regime. You can feel like you've had a great workout and you have. And he said, no, no, you got, you got the parody wrong. You want it the other direction. So we didn't patent it but it was fun to deal with. Point of this is we're building a model. We merge it all together, and that lets us build detailed models of a surgical case. This is done, as you can see here, where you can see the structure of the white matter tracks, the motor cortex. It's done using a toolkit we built called 3D Slicer, which is open source. You can download it if you want to play with it. It's been downloaded 1.5 million times around the world and is used extensively for this. And then that lets us build models like this, or like that. And what you're seeing here, that giant green thing needs to come out. But you can see the white matter tracks you want to avoid. And you can see those blue dots, that's the motor cortex. So now the surgeon can plan, how do I want to get there? How do I want to take it out? One of the things we played with, and you can tell we have a really bad sense of humor was, how do we warn the surgeon when they're getting really close to a place they shouldn't touch? And the students said, well, just, we'll just have a little, you know, alarm, something that will tell them they're getting close. And I said, no, we should have a feedback buzzer. You know, you get too close, you get zapped. And they pointed out, you probably don't want to jolt your surgeon while he's rooting around in your brain. So we gave up on that idea. But it was this idea of basically identifying, if you like, no-fly zones that the surgeon should not go into. And they don't. And they avoid those places. And then the last piece. This helps with planning. How do you deal with an actual surgery? Well, we used a trick that was invented by another one of my students. It's called a laser striper. The idea is pretty common today, but back in the 1990s, when you take a laser beam, you pass it through a cylindrical lens. That turns it into a plane of light. And you bounce it off a mirror. And if I have a flat table here, I can put another camera at an angle over here and a piece there. As I sweep that mirror, it will move the laser beam across the table, and it'll just create a line of light. And you can recognize where it is. It tells you where the table is. If you now have an object on the table, like a patient, it's going to deflect the beam in the camera. And the amount it moves it tells you high that, how high that point is. And you see that. You can see those lines. They're curving across the surface of the skin. So we automatically pull out these lines from the skin surface. And then we have a computer algorithm that very carefully aligns those points with the skin of the model. Because that tells us exactly how to relate what we see in surgery to the patient. And from that, we very carefully align it and we give the surgeon 3D vision. They can now see exactly where those structures are. And then during surgery, we track the instrument. We put a couple of LEDs on the, on the surgical instruments and that's what allows the surgeon now to both avoid places they want to avoid, see where their instrument is and take out the tumor. 
I'm going to just skip by these. These are just examples of it. And the last thing I'll show you is during surgery, one of the challenges you have is if you're removing portions of tissue, things shift. And so the model may no longer be accurate. And so the solution here was a very clever system. Working with GE, my colleagues at the hospital built an operating theater around an MR machine. If you've ever been through an MR machine, you know it's a little claustrophobic, it's a big cylinder. Imagine cutting a chunk out of the middle, so you've got two donuts, and you put the patient in the middle, and the surgeon literally stands between the two donuts, and the point of it is at any point during the surgery, they can get another image very quickly, and then adjust the model to reflect the position of the tissue. We were going to publish a paper on this, and I kept trying to persuade my students that there was a wonderful title for the article, scientific article they wouldn't accept. I'm going to say this very carefully. Shift happens. <laughs> and you get an idea of why they didn't want to use that title. And how we used it? Until we retired the system a few years ago, it was used in several thousand neurosurgical cases at Brigham and Women's Hospital. It is still used today for brachytherapy. If you happen to have prostate cancer, this is where you place tiny radioactive seeds around the tumor. It's used in sinus surgery. It's used in surgical planning for orthopedics, abdominal surgery, lung surgery. It's used for surgical training in Africa and many other procedures. It's giving surgeons the ability to be better surgeons. And that's probably the point I want to end with before I do the last part of this, which is we're not replacing the surgeon. We're giving them better tools. We're helping them do a better job of doing the operations they want to do. And that was my 20-year experience of dealing with it. I want to close with a couple of pieces of advice. I was going to aim it at young people, but I'll aim it at all of you because you're all young at heart. You can be an innovator if you're willing to do a couple of things. Explore ideas. What would you like to have that you don't? What would be cool if you could make it? Be willing to try it. The first one won't work. The tenth one won't work. Or maybe the eleventh one. But be willing to think about something different. And then try it. Create prototypes. Try them out. I want to point, especially younger folks, to something, or anybody, sorry, I shouldn't say that way, wonderful thing called App Inventor. This is a little um, system that was developed by a colleague at MIT. It works on cell phones, both on, on uh, Androids and on iOS. It teaches you a little bit of computer science along the way, but you can build an app. And there have been 8 million people around the world use App Inventor to create 30 million apps for everything from public safety in, in cities in India to um, keeping track of, of, of um, supplies in a mom and dad uh, pop store or mom and pop store. Just build something. App Inventor is a great thing to try. And when you do build those prototypes, have your friends kick the tires because you have an expectation of how it's gonna work and it may not. Build networks. Get advice from people who've done it before. You'll find most of them are willing to tell you that, but you can get great advice. And find somebody who complements your skills. I'll go back to Drew Houston and Arash Ferdowsi. Drew absolutely has the personality to be a CEO. As we used to say when I was younger, he could sell refrigerators to Eskimos. Sorry, no disrespect. It's a little too harsh on Drew, but he is a great spokesperson. He is a great people person. Arash is an example of that typical very bad MIT joke. How do you tell a really friendly MIT student? He looks at your shoes, not his shoes, when he talks to you. Arash should never be the front person, but an incredible back room hacker. Put the two together, they built Dropbox. And so be willing to find somebody that compliments you. And then augment your skills. If you're in college, explore a new area. You might discover you really like some other field. Or better yet, you might discover there's a wonderful synergy between two fields. So much of the problems today are multidisciplinary, and you really want to have that crossover. And fill in missing skills. Go take an online course. And I'm going to do a blatant publishing, or sorry, pushing for this. But take an online course. Um, it can fill in gaps in your background. It can bring your knowledge up to the current state. And they come in a whole range of scales. There are now what you call mini certificates, something that just takes a few hours a week for maybe two or three weeks, as opposed to do a full MOOC, massive open online course, where you take a course for 13 weeks. 
If you're really game, do a MicroMaster, something MIT invented, where you actually take a series of online courses, and if you're successful, you get a certificate that says you are an expert in logistics and supply chain or in advanced manufacturing or in something else. But they come in a range of areas. And I want to finish with telling you a story, and this is where the blatant self-promotion comes from. So farmer in Manitoba, I wish I had one from Saskatchewan, but this is a close enough story. Farmer in Manitoba, who took an online course from MIT. Happened to be my course. I have an online MOOC. This summer, we just went past our two millionth registrant for that online course. They don't all finish, but two million people have started that course. Now, he had a little inside push. His brother had been an MIT graduate, had taken my on-campus course, but said, you ought to go take this course. Took the course, discovered he liked it, took a couple of other courses, and then used um, an open source platform to build a remote control device that allows him to offload from his combine into a bin behind his tractor completely automatically. Tractor's unmanned, it just comes up and at speed, pulls up next to the combine and it unloads. He says he uses it 100 times every season, he saves thousands of dollars and it's a way of building something. That could be you. You could figure out how to do something that could really help out. And again, I just love the story of build something that's gonna help out and use a little bit of online learning to help you figure out how to get there. I'll be happy to take some questions. Like 15 minutes of questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Grimson. This is uh, from one educator who's coming from Canada and from Canadian University and looking at uh, MIT uh, academic and professor and also administrator. It was a great, interesting. I learned a lot. And thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to take you to that. Right, we want to keep you there. So I'm looking at see students here from high school, younger ones. Uh, I don't know if they are in science or they have an interest or they're going to get there. We have a younger one. I spot one. Yes, you just there. You may have um, questions for Dr. Benson. You know, we have people from different generations and demographics and backgrounds. Who wants to be the first one? I, I will warn you, as, as a professor, you know, nobody asks a question, I start asking questions, and that will really be dangerous. What would you like to know? Anna. I, I've been reading a lot about the chat bot, the AI right now. Where do you see that going? I mean, I'm a writer. Is it revolutionizing the right. content world? So chat GPT. It's, it's certainly in the news. It's not the only one, but it's definitely in the news. Microsoft has just incorporated their version. Um, I'm going to be a typical annoying professor. I'm going to give you three parts to the answer. You know, we never answer anything straight. I started in AI in 1975. In 1975, AI was something you scraped off the bottom of your shoe. It was like a cow pie. It was not well respected. I find it amusing and interesting to see where AI is today. It's not really answering your question, Tanya. But the point of it is, hype is hype. Right, so some of this is, I think, a little overextended, but it is impressive what ChatGPT can do. My own view is there's a distinction between something that is really good at summarizing and something that's creative. ChatGPT is really good at the former. It has access to an amazing amount of data, and if you try it, it will write something that is really impressive, but it's summarizing. And just like anything else, if there's some incorrect information it has, it doesn't know how to separate it out. So it will make some mistakes, but it is great at doing summary. It's not great at creating. Having said that, I think to be blunt, there are going to be some industries that are going to be disrupted. Um, and again, I don't want to insult anybody in the room. I would not want to be a paralegal today because what's a paralegal do? A lot of it is summarizing cases, it's doing search, um, and this is going to do, I think, an awfully good job of that. Uh, it's an area that's going to go away, I think. Um, I think in the media, it's going to be an interesting challenge. I think it can help, but I think that, again, the fact-checking, the making sure that the data is right is important because ChatGPT doesn't know how to sort that out. I think higher education is going to face an interesting challenge and opportunity. I would not want to be an admissions officer at a university. 
How do I know that essay was written by an 18-year-old or a computer? Of course, I could say, how do I know it was written by an 18-year-old or their 48-year-old father or mother? But, but, you know, it's going to be a challenge. On the other hand, I think education can improve by using this. Imagine learning a new language and having a system like that give you guidance. Imagine writing something and getting advice on how to make it better. I think ChatGP can do that in an interesting way. And I can tell you at MIT, we are challenged right now to look at, in fact, we'll hold a summit sometime later this year around how do we think about using this in other places. But just like in the surgical example, chat GPT is mostly a tool that's going to make somebody more efficient, more effective, and not replace them with maybe a few exceptions. I didn't mean to pick on paralegals. It's the one place I can think of that's really going to be disrupted here. Um, administrative assistance is another one that's going to be disrupted to some extent. Other things you'd like to ask? Yes, please, go. a lot of inventors and uh, really um, awesome innovators. What would be the number one skill that you think, um, like a lot of skill that you see students in MIT have or something for them to strive for, something common between all those very successful innovators? So what's the one thing I look for? All right. Sorry, I'm making the poor video guy move here, but I wanted to hear your question. It's a great question. By the way, congratulations on being a middle school teacher. It's one of the toughest jobs in the world. <clears throat> I envy, I, I don't envy you the, 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 the task. Um, and you can tell I'm thinking because it's a great question. If I had to pick one thing, I would say um, be bold, be willing to try, be willing to fail. Um, your first idea is not going to work. But if you're willing to try, you'll get there. Now, there's some pieces. Just having, you know, as soon as I say that, you're going, you can think of the kid who's way too aggressive and going, oh, my God, that's not who I want. You need to fill in the other pieces. You need to have some technical background. You need to, you need to understand what you want to deal with. But if you're not willing to try something, you're not going to get there. And the three examples I use, they all happen to come from humble backgrounds. That was deliberate. There's lots of students like that. But they were all willing to go out and try something to make it happen. And I think that's, that's really important. Um, I can remember talking several years ago with an alumna from MIT named Andrea Wong. No reason to know who she was. Um, she'd been a computer science major, got a um, MBA from Stanford, which is not uncommon, and then um, went to Columbia School of Journalism. Now, you don't think of somebody from MIT going to journalism school. She did. She was at ABC News for many years, and for eight years, she was the CEO of Lifetime Networks. She's responsible for bringing The Bachelor to North America. I don't know if that's a good thing or not, but you know, it's what she did. Why am I telling you this long story? I love telling stories. But I remember asking Andrea, what, if anything, did MIT do to help prepare you for this career? And she said, three things. I learned to be fearless. You don't get through the hard courses at MIT if you're intimidated. You've got to be willing to go out and try. She said, I learned to be a great analytic problem solver. It's really about how do I break things down into pieces I can solve with. And the third one has a little bit of an MIT spin, but there's a point to the story. She said, I wear my brass rat proudly. That's how we refer to the MIT ring. It's very distinctive. She said, everybody in Hollywood knows my background. She said, I can go into a meeting with Michael Eisner, former head of Disney, with Steven Spielberg. Everybody assumes I'm the smartest person in the room. And the point of the story wasn't to be arrogant. It was... They're going to take you seriously and give you a chance to explain your idea. And that comes back to the meritocracy. But if I had to say one thing, it's be willing to put yourself out there. Try something. And when it doesn't work, try the next thing until you can get somewhere. And I hope the next CTO of Uber comes from Estevan. It'd be wonderful. Well, maybe not Uber. I don't like Uber. Of Lyft. The next CEO of Lyft comes from Estevan. Yes, sir. What are the most important things to be accepted into an engineering program? I mean, as a student, what should you do? Mm, that's a great question. That's a really great question. I'll give you three parts. You can tell I always give you three parts to everything. I make up the other two if I only have one, but I'll give you three parts. Um, today, 
you need to know computer science. If you'd asked me this 40 years ago, you weren't around 40 years ago, your mom probably wasn't around 40 years ago, I would have said math. And math is really important, but today you need to know computer science. Doesn't mean you have to be a hacker, but if you don't understand how to think algorithmically, how to, how to break things down into modules, how to abstract things away, it's hard to name a field today that's not affected by computer science. So having, uh, please don't spend all your time in your room programming, all right? Do other things, but you need to know some computer science. If you don't, uh, you're at a disadvantage. Um, the second thing I would say is, I guess I already said it, math is really important. It's the underpinning of almost everything you do. Um, and then the third thing I would say is, especially if you're interested in engineering, try building things. Play with Lego, great thing, right? One of my favorite inventions in the world, build things. Build, and not just the kits, they're wonderful, but try something different. Um, but build other things. If your parents can help you out and they trust you with, with big equipment, try building something, try making something. Do it carefully, please. But trying to build something will help you understand what works and what doesn't work. But we'll go to the start, and I'm biased. If you don't know computer science today, you're not gonna succeed. I'll give you two numbers. 43% of all undergraduate students at MIT today major in computer science, 43%. Many of them are joint majors with economics, with brain and cognitive sciences, but computation's everywhere. If you don't know it, you're at a disadvantage. And good luck, I hope you end up someplace really good. Okay. Any last question? Yes, gentleman at the back. You mentioned you were into games, and MIT, and specialized specialize in AI. Forward thinking, something going into university now, what should they be maybe looking at? What is that future projection? Being so where is MIT headed or where should any university head? Yeah, oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah. 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 Great question. And sorry, I'm at an age where my hearing ain't what it once was, but thank you. <coughs> Pardon me. Question is basically, I, I got to see AI grow over. 50 years, where is it headed? I think the biggest thing you're going to see with AI in the next 20 years is that it is going to be so heavily embedded in every other discipline that you're not going to be able to distinguish it from those other disciplines. Let me give you three examples to, to, to give you a sense of why I say that. Discovery of new drugs. I want to tell you a very quick story. Sorry, Gord, it's not a quick story, but you know how it is. I want to tell you a quick story because it gives you a sense of why AI is changing things already. I have two colleagues um, that collaborated together. One, Regina Barsley is a famous computer scientist. She's a natural language processing person, a machine learning expert. The other one, Jim Collins, is a famous uh, synthetic biologist. That means he studies biology as if it was an engineering discipline, treat pieces of biology as if they were elements of a circuit. Jim was really interested in antibiotic resistant bacterial infections. He would say to me, I don't wanna ever have to go into a hospital. And I say, Jim, I don't either because it means something's wrong with me. And he said, no, I don't wanna have to go into a hospital because I don't wanna catch a superbug and come up with something worse. It's the point of my story. Jim and Regina got together and they built an AI system, but not just throw a bunch of data at a, at a deep learning algorithm. They built into it a lot of knowledge about chemistry and about biology. And then they said, most current antibiotics are variants of things that were discovered 100 years ago. It's really hard for a pharma company to find something different. And so they designed the system to have that knowledge and then to look in places far away from known drugs. Ran the system for about a week on a big chunk of data. It came back with 20 recommended molecules. They used their knowledge and notice the point of the story. It's their expertise on top of it to pick what they thought was the most promising one. Synthesized it, they tried it on 25 known antibiotic resistant bacterial infections. And it had impact on 24. It was one lung infection it did not have any impact on. 
They did what's called a mouse model to show it work in, in, in living systems. They did it for six months to show that the bacteria did not adapt to it. And they're now talking to big pharma companies. They discovered a drug that was far away from known solutions. I tell you this story because, at least for me, there's a fun part about dealing with this, which is people at MIT are nerds. At least that's our reputation, right? You know, we're the people that sat at the back of the room nobody talked to. Well, Jim and Regina are nerds. They've discovered a new drug. They get to give it a name. And so they chose to call this new drug Halicin, H-A-L-I-C-I-N. Well, I-C-I-N, that sounds like, you know, penicillin, sounds like the name of the drug. And where did Hal come from? 2001 A Space Odyssey. It's named after the computer in that, in that movie. You're not smiling. A drug didn't work with you, but I want to give you a sense of where is it headed? It's going to be used to discover new drugs, to create new materials, uh, to, to um, design road systems, transportation systems. It's going to be a, hard to find a place where AI is not heavily used as a tool. Is it going to get to the place where it replaces us? I don't think so. I don't think it has the creativity, but it is going to be there. And one of the things that both the field has to think about and you have to think about is, how do you regulate it? Self-driving car has an accident. Who's liable? My view is a Tesla, Elon Musk, because he cuts away too many shortcuts. But you know, whatever it is, self-driving car, you got to think about who's responsible for it. Face recognition system. Um, when I flew in from the US, um, I boarded the plane, not by scanning my passport, took my picture. How do you think about privacy issues as you deal with it? So we as citizens have to think about the regulatory part of it, but it's hard to see a place where it's not gonna have an impact. And I think you're gonna see it in discovery of new materials, creation of new, of new systems in, in, very, in very big ways. One last question. Yeah. You've been in admissions, you've seen the process of how students get accepted over the years. Have you seen any trends in the, say, communities where these students come from that the communities are doing something different to help these students become MIT students or grads? The city is doing that, that would help students? Oh boy, that's a really good question. Um, <laughs> Sorry. No, it's a great question. Um, let me give you a very quickly tiny bit of context. Um, to be blunt, MIT's fortunate. We're an elite school. You know, we're one of the best in the world. Our admission rate is uh, sadly about 3%. We admit about 3% of our applicants. But what do we look for? Um, we certainly look for smarts. These kids are incredibly bright. But one of the things we look for, and this is a place where a community could help, we look for resilience. Doesn't matter how smart you are, you're gonna show it up on heat and something's gonna go wrong. Another way of saying it is, everybody at MIT is an undergraduate, is the top of their class, or maybe second in their class. Well, guess what? By the laws of mathematics, half of you are now below average. This is a strange place to be, and it's a little challenging. And so resilience, how have you dealt with something hard? How have you dealt with failure is something really important. That's why, going back to something I said to the young lady over here, be willing to be bold because something's going to fail and you're going to learn from that. To the extent that Estevan can create spaces, create programs that help students take risks and then deal with them well and show resilience. I know that's something that MIT looks for. Um, put it this way, if we have two applicants, one of them grew up in Lexington, Massachusetts, where I happen to live, where 35% of the fathers of the students at the high school have doctorates, and 15% of the mothers have doctorates. It's an incredibly educated town. You've got a student coming from there, and you've got a student coming from Bienfait, or Bienfait, if you like, although we, we know we don't pronounce it that way. And I don't mean to pick on Bienfait, but it's a different kind of setting. You don't have the same advantages of Lexington, Massachusetts. If you have two students who look the same, you know who MIT picks? the kid from being paid. Because given where they're coming from, they've shown that resilience to move forward in a better way. So I'm not saying, please don't dumb down Esteban and make it a really terrible place so that you're lower, but find ways to help your kids 
show resilience, explore things, try things out, show that they're willing to take that gamble. That's what we look for. I'll leave you with the last MIT story, unless there's a last question here. I'll make it, I think I'm on time, Gord, close to on time. I joke by saying, you know, MIT's full of nerds. We have a bunch of really bright kids there, but one of the changes in the kinds of students we look for is they're much broader today. They have other skills. They're interested in making an impact on the world. And so I'll leave you with a number that usually surprises people. Most people don't think we have any athletes at MIT. We actually field more teams in the NCAA than any other university in the country. Where it's called a Division Three school, which means we give no scholarships to athletes. We give only scholarships to students who need it. But the NCAA runs something called the Learfield Cup, where depending how your team does, you get points. If you win your conference, you get some points. You go into the tournaments, you win some points. Last year, among all Division Three schools in the United States, MIT ranked in athletics second. People don't expect that. So if you happen to be an athlete as well, that's great. We're always looking for great athletes who are really smart. Um, and, uh, you know, part of that is you're using a different part of your brain. Thank you for your time. It's great to be back in Estevan. Uh, I'm really delighted to have a chance to share a little bit of a story. And I hope for some of you it gives you a sense of who knows where you might end up. Um, but I hope you do end up someplace really good. Thank you. Give you something so that when you are home, you can remember your roots. This oh, that is, is fantastic. Byron uh, Fletcher. Uh, Fletcher. So, um, That's wonderful. Yeah. Thank you so much. I think we have a new motto for, for the community, eh? Be bold. Hey, I, I love what you said there. It was wonderful. Thank you so oh, much for coming. Absolutely. Really My pleasure. pleasure. My pleasure. Thanks. <laughs>